Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Latest Shiny Podcast. This is your host, Stephen Spector. Uh, thanks for joining us. And with me, as usual, of course, is Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, good mid-morning, Rob. Hello, Stephen. Good to talk with you. Good. And I try to keep our listeners trying to figure out when we record these. Maybe one day we'll have to do some sort of contest to see. And uh, with us today, we have a great guest, and I'm excited because this, uh, our guest, Ian Ray, who is the CEO and founder of CloudOps, is actually at the Google Next event right now. And of course, by the time you listen to this, the Google Next conference will be a few weeks away, but it's still great to have um, his ideas fresh. So Ian, welcome to the podcast and give our uh, listeners a, a short overview of yourself and then we'll jump in. Thanks guys. Um, really excited to be here. Yes, uh, guilty as charged, founder, CEO of CloudOps. We um, might be the oldest independent um, cloud consulting and engineering company around. Uh, we started in 2005, started uh, using EC2 in 2006, back in the good old you know uh, days of no persistent storage. And we have decided over the years to remain uh, completely independent, uh, bootstrapped, customer funded, um, and it's been a really, uh, really exciting journey. And over time, we have, the, the, way, the way I like to summarize what we do is helping our customers own their destiny in the cloud. Uh, but really, primarily, our, our job is to help folks get to cloud uh, responsibly, safely, and successfully. And then most importantly, the reason why we're called cloud ops is we really think that the really differentiated problem is is uh, developing operational excellence and uh, and the ability to continuously improve once you're uh, once you're in the cloud. We're we're going to have some fun. It's it's worth noting you and I go way back in the OpenStack community, so I definitely want to check in with you on that. In the we'll, we'll, I have other shiny objects I want to chase first, but talking about that and where that's going as as part of this overall cloud journey with on prem and and public. And things like that, but it's, it sounds like from a cloud ops perspective, you're agnostic, right? You're you're not trying to do on-prem clouds or AWS exclusively. You're you're sort of the cloud. You know, let's get cloud done. Do you want to? Can you define cloud from from a cloud ops perspective? From yeah, that's. I mean, uh, that was always the uh, the the really fun conversation back in the day, uh, defining cloud. But I think you know, for us, it's really about you know, software defined, API driven. Um, so you can really do end to end automation. Uh, it's, it's really about, uh, you know, the, the self-service and, and the sort of, uh, you know, engineering led, um, you know, developer led consumption of, uh, of IT for us. I mean, I understand that a lot of the market and very successful cloud services are delivered as software as a service. That's really not where cloud ops plays. We have customers who are SaaS companies, but uh, we are really focused on um, helping organizations um, like enterprises and and and, and telcos and uh, r really get to cloud successfully. Uh, and again, you know, it's about APIs and end to end automation and uh, continuous delivery of services. And therefore, you know, we used to, I used to think of this as a technology model but really uh over time i've really uh thought of it more as a business model and an operations model and uh with and this is where we've had special focus on the on the operations model because we've we what we've noticed is that that's really the hardest thing and that's what differentiates the companies that are successful and are not successful or is really that operational excellence I think that that's a really important takeaway for this, right? Because you could use exactly the same technologies in a non-cloud way, uh, enter VMware and just realizing the favorite refrain of, you know, virtualization is not cloud. I, th I think you're, you've summarized really nicely why it's not. Front edge of what cloud is keeps moving. And you and I, it feels like our discussions <laughs> every time we meet, we're, we're always trying to figure out what that, what that front edge is, not just what it's, what's the, 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 the latest shiny, the, the, what it could be, but you and I actually have very pragmatic discussions, which I like. And, and since I have Travel Envy, well, I don't have Travel Envy, I have Google Next Envy. Can, <laughs> can, you, can you put, yeah, very happy not to travel, um, can you put some of what you're hearing from Google Next into that context? Sure. You know, rewinding 
maybe seven or eight years. So CloudOps has always really believed that, you know, the cloud was going to be a hybrid thing and that there, that there was going to be these really large public clouds that would have incredible capabilities. And then those would be combined with more regional, regionalized and uh, specialized cloud services. And I, I do think that is more or less coming to pass. And, you know, we used to talk about, again, like six, seven years ago, there were, there were likely to be really three really large uh, cloud providers. Amazon was clear already. Microsoft, it was easy to predict because Microsoft is by far the most relied upon, you know, enterprise IT vendor. And yeah, absolutely. Like there was, there was no way they weren't, they were just, it was going to take until version 3.1 for sure. Um, for, but you know, we were, we, we always believed Microsoft was going to get there. Um, right. The, the more controversial one has always been talking about Google. And what we found is that the market actually generally didn't believe Google was a player or was going to be a player by and large, I think there were certain people who thought that they could be a player, but really generally the conversation was up until a couple of years ago, it's Amazon versus Microsoft. We've always felt that Google's the dark horse in, in, in that race. And I think they're emerging now. And um, in some ways, you know, Google is kind of like the engineer's cloud. I mean, they really have a very, uh, uh, they, they, they have they have a very sort of disciplined engineering approach to building their cloud services, and they, uh, you know, I, I, I find that uh, they, they, there's a lot of fans just simply of uh, the way that they've built their services in a very structured, composable manner. Um, and obviously, they're very good at at, at building API-driven, you know, they, services. They do they do have a bit of a of a challenge in that they they are opinionated. And, and that's their that's their design win, right? They're like, look, if you do it the way, you know, follow our patterns, then it, you're gonna you're gonna win. And they have history to sort of stand by their side, but you have to agree to their patterns. Is that that's the way I've always felt about their their cloud infrastructures and what they've done. Even Kubernetes, um, to an extent, is Google patterns that they've you know uh, explained in a way that that have. A, Gained widespread adoption. Do you, is that is that a fair characterization, or do you think? Yeah, I think that's a that? yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. I mean, you know, we respect all the cloud providers for different reasons. I mean, you know, Amazon is just phenomenal at relentlessly listening to customers and delivering what they want in a manner that is you know good enough out of the gate, and then they iterate from there. And so that, that leads to, I think, for what, what looks like to a lot of people, very messy, confusing sort of set of services that in some cases are delivered in ways that are inconsistent uh, in terms of that, uh, those design patterns that you're talking about, but is incredibly effective and has allowed for incredible momentum and incredible success because they're just relentlessly focused on what customers want. I find that like we find that Google is more likely to think through the problem and come up with their own opinion to your point as to what the right way to do something is. And then, um, and then, and then bring that to the market and then sort of expect folks to learn about sort of that particular approach to it. That's why we sort of think of it as like the, 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 the engineers cloud versus, you know, Amazon, which is really like, you know, the, the cloud for everyone because they're really, <laughs> They're they're you know it's, they're the everything store, right? Uh, they they are, and they've they've they're they've been sprawling. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I know Google. I think is is uh, is very thoughtful and very um, very methodical, and that you can really tell once you start to learn sort of when you learn more about their opinion as to how services should be built and consumed and put together uh, and composed on a larger scale you know, once you start to learn about it, it's like, wow, this makes a lot of sense. They've really thought this through. It's not necessarily as accessible uh, in some cases as um, uh, as Amazon. They're different, it's, right? It's funny because, I mean, the early Amazon clouds were, you know, hey, read the APIs. We're too busy to give you a UX type of thing. And uh, obviously the game shifted. That's not acceptable in today's world. But 
they had a filter, right? Am early Amazon, there was, and you were there, it had a filter of you could understand you know, what we were doing and use it, and there was no easy button. That's so true. I mean, and obviously that left room for folks like us to help people uh, get started and, and build and consume and, and, and operate. And I think that's still the case to some extent. Uh, I, 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 that said, they are kind of like... <laughs> I, don't, I don't think there's an easy button yet for cloud. Yeah, I was going to say uh, the, the the thing that they I think they've done very successfully is as the as the first major mover is really to educate the market. And so the challenge for you know it's a little bit like back in the day when you know Cisco became the way to do networking. Well, anyone who wasn't Cisco who wanted to offer networking products was at a disadvantage because the market was educated on how to use the Cisco CLI, right? Yeah. Um, that's definitely, you know, an issue. And, and the fact is with the three major cloud providers, and as you pointed out before, we are fundamentally cloud agnostic. Our job is to help our customers with all the, all these cloud providers. The, you know, one of the challenges is that I feel like the analysts got it deeply wrong years ago and they sort of said, Hey, uh, this is a, you know, these cloud providers are commodity infrastructure. It's a race to the bottom. It's a price war. What we're actually seeing is, you know, highly differentiated platform services that uh, aren't uh, sort of normalized out of the box, easily exchangeable um, resources. And so it's really taken the rise of, I'd say, open source in the last five or six years as sort of a key strategy towards how you can be successful in cloud and taking things like, you know, containerization with Docker, et cetera, to start allowing our customers to really reap the benefits of building software one way and then being able to operate it across multiple clouds, which is a common, which is a common <laughs> need. All right. So, so um, you're, you're not, you're not using the word that I'm going to break in with, which is hybrid. And it's, I used to love hybrid. Uh, I, I used to hate it. I used to love it. Now I'm a little bit more ambivalent because you, you started with the statement of these clouds are becoming highly differentiated. So this vision of cloud agnostic workload, maybe may a way to say it, and I could put it anywhere and it's hybrid is not the way the market's been moving. And what you just described is sort of this container nirvana of, you know, Kubernetes being a universal abstraction layer for infrastructure, maybe. Where, where's, where are yeah. we? Right? Do we need hybrid? Is it, is it the multi-cloud vision? Is that even a good word? You know, that's a really good point. I mean, I, I've been burned by this before. I think I got up on stage in 2009 at, at, at the first Cloud Connect and talked about uh, sort of this, uh, you know, hybrid cloud end state and, and was, I would say, you know, more or less laughed off stage. And, but, but I think that, you know, the world is more comp you know, complicated and complex than most of us would, would like to believe. And, and the reality is that most reasonably large organizations, you know, have to use multiple cloud providers and have some mix of both public cloud and sort of, you know, regional, I, I try to avoid the word private cloud, but, you know, regional, um, let's say edge, <laughs> edge infrastructure. And, and, and that's just the reality. And so I think uh, one of the key roles in open source and one of the big opportunities has been, you know, being that kind of counterbalancing force to help make sure that one can run a, in a similar manner across multiple infrastructures, even if those cloud platforms aren't necessarily designed to help customers do that. And I think Google, you know, back to Google, obviously I'm at Google Next. I think their strategy has been differentiated around open source. I think all the cl big cloud providers have a bit of a different relationship to it. You know, Amazon uses a ton of open source, but doesn't give back really uh, no proportionate, back. right? <laughs> Microsoft is sort of woken up to open source and is, is, uh, is, is increasingly, you know, investing and realizing that that's key to its future. But I find that Google has the most sophisticated strategy around open source. I, people, I think, don't realize just how deeply Google contributes and, and it is part of it, in part just because cor these corporate entities are very quiet in, in, in how they work. 
um, very, their messaging is very controlled. So it's hard for them to get in front of open source contributions in a, in a, in a really positive way. I mean, that's where, you know, there's a couple of projects that, that Kubernetes, that Google did a good job of. It's interesting because we haven't mentioned IBM as, as, and, you know, Gartner is now, you know, written everybody else off from public cloud. IBM actually does a really nice job of contributing an open source, participating and, and, and being very visible there. Yeah, but it hasn't, it, that hasn't translated into a big uh, win, maybe because of the operations and infrastructure investments required to compete at those levels. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. You're right. You know, IBM was probably the first, like, really large tech company to do, you know, large scale and, and you know, deep and wide investments in open source. I think, you know, the challenge with IBM is that they never really built cloud services. I mean, not, not in the, not in sort of the, um, in, in, in the kind of modern uh, sense of, you know, d building it for developers and yeah. really com being committed to software defined. We still have issues with software or customers have issues with software from time to time where they have to open a trouble ticket. So someone can reconfigure, you know, re remap a, a VLAN or something thing like that. So, um, you know, I, I think the, the, the challenge with IBM and some of those other providers is that they're very much, their inertia <laughs> was really very much in the, uh, in the world of traditional infrastructure and hosting. Well, and it, it was very hard for them to transition to a, 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 a cloudy world. Well, but, and this is, this I think is an interesting segue for OpenStack because th this expectation that individual open source projects are going to create the type of integrated service fabric that Amazon has put together where Google or Microsoft have been, you know, getting much closer on has not materialized, right? I mean, OpenStack, yeah. you know, has a, a ton of services that they tried to pull into the project to sort of compete with Amazon on, on the service components, but it's not, it's been a very uneven journey compared to, the way Amazon works is that do you, is, am I am I saying that well? Is you, is that yeah, problem? yeah. I, th I think that's a great. That's I think I, I think that's absolutely true. But you know, I remember like I'd show up at, at you know at OpenStack conferences and be like, "Where's the product management and where's the mm -hmm. and 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 what I found interesting is like we were a lot of there were a lot of developers, a lot of infrastructure folks, but you know it's hard to compete with Amazon when you don't have the 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 the, the, the the people out there with the customers relentlessly focused on delivering a customer experience. And so, so I, I think we, we fell into the trap of trying to rebuild all the services, but yeah. not necessarily think about that last mile between the, between the technology and the actual end customer. And uh, I think similarly, and you and I have had this chat yeah. many times over the years is there was also a reticence to really dive in and own the operational success of the customers. And so we spent so much time talking about how do you build OpenStack and really not enough time talking about how do you, how do you operate and continuously deliver and deliver great customer experiences with it? I, you know, I've been, I literally was just playing with some OpenStack install stuff and it's still, you know, I keep coming back to it like an excited puppy and still, you know, we, it, it hasn't been a focus at, at a very arch foundational architectural level. And I, I know there's probably OpenStack people who are shouting at the mic, you know, shouting at their, their podcast, but uh, it just hasn't, um, I'm sorry. It, you, there are people running OpenStack at scale. I know you're helping people do that, but you know, compared to what we see out of a Kubernetes environment and they're very different fish, it's, there's a different operational thing, right? I was, I brought up an OpenStack cluster and it didn't have HTTPS turned on by default. And I just, I just slammed my head on the desk because that's the most basic yeah. um, thing. And so I know that there are vendors out there who will help you and I know there's, there's maybe better processes than what I used. Um, there's an interesting component in what you're saying, and I'm I, not the technical side, but the product management piece of saying, oh, listening to the users, connecting users and letting users drive your priorities, like, like you're, you're pointing out Amazon doing drives is, you know, is much more of an innovation driver than letting 
developers scratch their own itch? Actually, I should ask that as a question, right? How is, is, is that a missing piece? Well, you know, I, I think so. I mean, the longer we do what we do, the more we appreciate the, the challenge as well as the opportunity of that kind of user experience innovation, as opposed to simply the, I just figure out a way to deliver, you know, storage more efficiently with erasure coding and, you know, being able to do some clever sort of, you know, IOPS tiering. I mean, it, it you know, it takes both, you know, it takes both sides, but I, I feel like in, in OpenStack, we've been just overly focused on like the, the underlying guts and just expecting like the various participants in the ecosystem to actually, you know, figure out how to deliver it in a way that delights, uh, you know, users then leads to great business outcomes. One of the things we're starting to see now is, is and you know, we work a lot with uh, regional telcos and OpenStack is, is out there and OpenStack is, I would even argue it is, has become the standard for, uh, you know, open source infrastructure, you know, in particular in the, in the telco world. But I, I think it's, it's, um, it still has a lot of challenges and I think it's, it's now at risk of, well, it, I'm not even sure at risk of, I think it has almost become the legacy as, you know, a lot of folks are looking at how do they deliver a sort of purely, um, pardon the term cloud native, but sort of, you know, containerized uh, infrastructure um, and avoid some of that, the, 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 the complexity and operational challenges of, of, um, of OpenStack. Not that containers are without their operational challenges, but there is a certain uh, improvement in simplicity. Um, and the other, the other trend that we're seeing there is, is as actually this. Uh, I, I'm laughing because I, I can give you numbers because I'm actually running a, a test like that, but um, it's starting. Okay. We're, we're installing Kubernetes, worst case, eight minutes. And my OpenStack best case single node is over 40. Right. And that's just installing it, right? And so if you and, and we get into some of the operational, some of the some of the operational uh, maneuvering you need to do in the real world, so the changing the proverbial changing the tires while the vehicles were you know rolling down the highway, which you sort of have to do in in a, in a modern sort of uh, you know as a service world, things get even more you know stark when it comes to comparing the the operational challenges. Of uh, of OpenStack versus a more of a uh, more of a more of a cloud native stack, but right. the other thing that's going on, and I'll, I'll share this from the you know again, it'll be old news by the time listeners are are uh, are, are listening to this, but you know Google has just announced uh, GKE being available uh, for on premises infrastructure. Mm -hmm. This is really interesting to me as well, because, you know, we all, and lots of folks are running Kubernetes in all kinds of uh, situations these days, um, Kubernetes and containers. Control plane aspect of delivering and managing, instantiating and, and, and managing um, Kubernetes is still, you know, it's still not a trivial issue. And so I find it really interesting that you know, Google's made this decision to allow their control plane to be used to um, to to manage uh, operate um, you know uh, Kubernetes clusters wherever they may lie. Right. right. So it so, so ties into a, edge computing. It ties into all that. It's not exactly an on-premises cluster in the fact that the, they're and correct me if I'm wrong, but their 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 on-premises offering is more like what Platform Nine does for OpenStack which is we run the control plane in cloud, you run the, the, the machines, sometimes called the workers, right? And then, yep. so we'll do the heavy lift, heavy, I'm air quoting heavy lift. You're, you're just providing hard, the hardware compute and the, you know, the, the, con the containers run in, in your facilities. Um, yep. That's not an edge, that's not really an edge configuration, right? If, if you know, you're, you're dependent on access to their clouds and the latency and, and the ingress and um, security, all those things have to be configured to, for you to run that cluster. It's not really a on-premises cluster from that perspective. Yeah, I to totally agree that it's, it's, it's now, it's, it's sort of like a new kind of hybrid, right? 
Uh, and it is very similar to, I think, Platform 9 is a, is a, is a good example of, of sort of that model. The reason I think it's particularly interesting is I think because so many people, so, so many organizations are deeply challenged with the, both the operational excellence aspect of things, as well as the, that kind of end user experience and delivering sort of, you know, deliver, continuously delivering the, the, the features that the customers want and in a way which, again, is, 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 is relatively seamless. I think that model is going to be more successful than it initially appears. So I, th I think this news is, is a big deal because of how hard it is to um, build the, the end user experience as well as the operational capabilities in a way that's completely on premises. And I think this is part of this trend as well for the, the cloud to be actually spilling towards the edge. It will be, it remains to be determined how, you know, how the edge, uh, sort of the completely, uh, let's say, uh, the autonomous edge uh, is going to, is going to deal with this. Something to watch in the next year or two. I like your definition for edge. I agree with this, which is edge is not, you know, just 5G data centers. It's, it's really all these non-cloud instances. So you're just, you're, the hint I'm getting from you is, you know, uh, what we would normally have thought is on-premises IT, you're defining as edge IT from that perspective. Is that a fair? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of debate as to what what is edge. I think edge is different things to different people. <laughs> I think it, it ranges everything from, you know, on-premises, uh, I think, infrastructure and sort of, uh, you know, cell tower base station infrastructure. But I would, I think there's also almost an argument to be made that, um, that like a regional cloud is also going to be in the future some form of edge computing, something that sits in a particular geopolitical region, it, you know, could be considered at some point um, form of edge 10 years from now. We might, uh, we'll we see. might not call it edge, we'll just call it uh, geolocal or local cloud or something. <laughs> Yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of stuff to sort out in terms of our relationship with, um, you know, data, data ownership, uh, the, the legal aspects of, of, of data, which are, you know, frequently leading to jurisdictional conflict these days. But I, you know, I think there's always going to be a need for some amount of, um, you know, edge computing, however, however you define it, I, I'm actually really bullish on edge computing, I think. Uh, you know, we're going to need more computing closer to the um, closer to the users. The, the the sort of highly centralized cloud model is, is provably not going to solve you know all of our problems, and it's going to be a combination of the sort of central and the, and the edge computing. The question I have is like, who's delivering the control plane for that? And you know, back to back to VMware for a second. You know, I think what a lot of the traditional vendors have kind of failed to do is become the the relevant control plane of the future. Um, I think, yeah, you know, great. everybody wants to be that in general. However, we, uh, we kind of advocate to our customers that be very careful about control planes. We, we like to see open source in the control plane because we feel that that's one of the key things that allows our customers to have a better likelihood of owning their destiny as, as, uh, as the industry moves forward. So it's an interesting component because right, part of the challenge with this is that VMware, OpenStack, you know, it, all of these, these, these platforms really obfuscate the underlying infrastructure. That's their job. They don't solve the infrastructure problem. For Amazon, you know, the big players, they have a relatively small number of data centers and they handle that. Well, what you're describing in edge infrastructure and also describing in IT infrastructure, because it has the same problems, is you don't have the people, you don't have the process, you don't have the consistency to you know, apply a, you know, a global solution. You, you're, you're point by point solutions with this. So it's not, VMware never solved the BIOS patch or never well solved well, right? Actually operating that gear, <laughs> it, it, it hid that problem. And, and so you still had to deal with it. Somebody had to deal with it. Exactly. Amazon, Amazon exactly. took it off your plate. Um, and to me, when I, when I look at OpenStack, one of the things that we never appreciated in, in design of OpenStack and then in go-to-market, you and I have sort of hinted at already in this, this call, is the complexity of 
every data center having some bespoke systems of record or networking topologies or you know nuances on the machines that make writing software for that environment much much more difficult um, and so we do have to that, that's going to be a challenge in edge because it's not going to be solved um, you know by you know a, a hundred thousand server data center that where everything was bought in the same week and wired together and then provisioned um, it's a different problem the, absolutely yeah I mean, I, I just on the note of, I mean, are we talking about Google doing their sort of on, what they call the on-premises G, GKE, but, you know, I believe now Snowball uh, from, from, from Amazon is, is now allowing us to run, um, you know, local EC2 instances. Makes sense. Right. So but that's, but it's, an, it's still their hardware. It's, we're not going to have, we're not going to populate the edge with snowballs. Maybe we will, and Amazon will just own everything. I, I just don't see the, the markets turning out. Is there is there some driver that you think is going to make demand for this edge, uh, you know, geo local infrastructure go faster? What's what's the commercial driver? Well, I think there's a lot of regional applications that are, you know, whether it's like smart cities or it's uh, advanced manufacturing. I mean, you you can't a lot of these use cases you cannot. You, you cannot simply build something in the public cloud and then sort of expect the, uh, the networking to, to just uh, support those, those use cases. You, you know, data has gravity, as you know, it's like you can't move everything back to the cloud for processing. So, you know, I think what we're seeing now is this massive opportunity given the low cost of computing at the edge and a lot of the amazing capabilities we have from, you know, IOT to, you know, AI, um, you know, predictive analytics, all that stuff. Um, and then just, you know, a lot of just sort of more basic big data use cases. We need to run more infrastructure at the edge. That's, that's clear. Uh, but operationally, once again, it's a pain for organizations to have the talent and to, to get the right you know, vendor solutions that allow them to reliably build and operate, uh, the edge. And I, I, I think that's where, um, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of innovation and a lot of, uh, and a real war for who owns the control plane for, um, for delivering, uh, for delivering edge infrastructure. So I know that cloud ops is building a software to an extent. You want to, you want to take a, a minute and describe sort of the, why you're, you're doing that. What, what problems do you think need to get solved? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the software that we're, that we build is, is, you know, we sort of noticed time and time again, we have a lot of customers who are service providers and they, they kind of, they, you can think of them a bit as a restaurant. They're like, they, they're, they're building a menu of services for whatever their stakeholders, customers, you know, um, you know, happen to be interested in. And, and a lot of these service providers have a lot of different services that are built on a lot of different vendor equipment, software, et cetera. And, and they're starting to integrate public cloud services into that menu of services. And uh, what we noticed is there wasn't anyone who was really worrying about kind of the, 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 the user experience for that menu of services. Uh, you know, uh, you could think of it as, um, you know, the next generation sort of, of, of BSS, OSS for telco. You know, if a modern service provider is fundamentally a cloud service provider, well, then how do they have that sort of, how do they deliver a single pane of glass, which allows them to plug in all the services that they want to deliver to their customers, price them, meet them, rate them, uh, control the user experience and all that, and then reserve the right to change what is uh, what the underlying service is delivered using, right? For example, a compute service, you could deliver it from EC2 one day, but you might decide as a service provider that Google's a better option at some point. You know, how do you change that in the back end without completely radically uh, you know, changing your, 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 your customer experience. And so we basically built software uh, that we're launching this fall and we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to be open sourcing it as well, that just is designed to normalize sort of the back end sort of cloud services to be able to present them and combine them in a way that meets the, you know, whatever the particular needs of the, 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 the cloud provider. And we're, we're seeing a lot of interest in, in sort of uh, enterprise shared services for this kind of model as well, because enterprises have to deliver, you know, a huge menu of services. And it's a, it's a real problem for them when, when, it's, when each vendor's uh, solution has to be delivered in a different way. And so um, 
that's that's the software we've been building and 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 has had some uh, some some success in the last couple of years. So we're we're really eager to bring it to market and and also bring it in an open source model because uh, we're just hearing a lot of demand for it. I, hats off. I, I think that there, there's very clear need for multi cloud management portals and some abstraction layers with this. It's it's very much chasing um, a, a huge target from that perspective because the, these vendors are not not converging in in <laughs> on on their models. It, it feels to me like and this is where we started the the discussion, right? It feels like they're diverging. Yeah, it's that's a very good observation. I mean, the analysts again way back when were like, "Oh, these are infrastructure as a service providers. They're all going to offer kind of the same stuff." But really, it turns out they're platform providers. And so, like, like I think of Amazon really as like the new Win32 in a sense. I mean, it, it's mm -hmm. it's um, yeah. you know, folks just decide to use it because it's it's. Uh, I mean, there's lots of re good reasons to decide to use it, but the really simple one on the business layer would be they are the 800 pound gorilla, you can't be, no one's going to get fired for choosing Amazon, right? So, uh, you know, so it's an easy decision to make, but I think uh, what folks often don't realize is that these are really platform plays. And so we see a lot of value. We see our customers seeing a lot of value in helping them understand what is the undifferentiated heavy lifting versus the differentiated heavy lifting of their businesses understanding how that maps to uh, cloud providers undifferentiated versus differentiated services right so uh example would be like you know ec2 is relatively undifferentiated and you've got a reasonably good chance of being able to migrate or use uh, you know compute instances in a similar manner with other cloud providers not identical unfortunately but uh, and that's really where our software is, tr is trying to solve that that, that layer but then there's these amazing services that are completely differentiated, like, you know, Greengrass and, you know, Redshift. And so, and, and we're certainly not like we we're huge proponents of those kinds of services, but what we try to make sure is that, you know, uh, working closely with our customers is that we are all eyes wide open on why are we using a particular service? What are the, the business benefits and is there is there a reason, for example, that the need for you know my business, if I happen to be a data analytics business, maybe I cannot be all in on Redshift because maybe I need to do the kinds of things that I do in particular geographic regions where Amazon's not available. You know that sort of process of like understanding where the line of normalization should be and being able to differentiate between the sort of um, the, uh, the the business differentiated the business undifferentiated services is, is is typically a really important conversation uh, with the market and what we find is that it's something that you have to circle back on regularly to update your understanding of, of what goes where because it's moving so fast as as you know yeah are are people going to be able to install software to you know solve this problem by saying oh I don't want to use Redshift I want to install my own platform that does it, right, that that manages data or tracks you know does analytics as a software you know it, are people going to buy software anymore or is that dead yeah i think buying software is, is is dying fast i think it's it's uh folks are i think pretty in many cases happy to move to a subscription model now not all cloud subscription models are created equal some like salesforce are still asking that you commit to like a three-year deal paid potentially up front with um, it's not <laughs> but then you can contrast that to slack where slack actually will adjust the billing to my business based upon how many active users i have and they don't even require that i figure out how many active users i have they're tracking it for me and they're, they're billing me uh, fairly based on on, on utilization so I think we are definitely moving, like it's clear that the market is, is moving to that model. I, I think what you brought up was really, you know, the, the, you know, again, being at Google Next, this is sort of fresh in my head, but it seems like Google, one of the things that is differentiating Google right now is they're trying to say, look, uh, you can either rely on our services, but we're also gonna build open source software that allows you to run something similar yourself. And then it's up to you to make the decision about whether you want that, you want to take on the, the, the engineering challenge and operational challenge of running this software yourself or simply 
rely on us to do the the uh, the heavy lifting for you, which I think is quite an interesting strategy that differentiates Google from Amazon and from Microsoft. And so we're seeing a lot of Google launches open source project to do something like, you know, data pipelines or data analytics, or they'll dive into an Apache project, which already does that, that they want to support in that direction. Right. Um, <clears throat> and, and I, I think that is, uh, to your point, providing that customer option of, Hey, you can try to run it yourself or you can just rely on us to get it completely as a service. I think they're trying to make sure that the, the end result, like the, you, that you get reproducible results, your results will be the same either way. It's your choice as to whether you want to worry about how hard it is to build and operate the infrastructure and, uh, and, and manage the software yourself or not. So Ian, this is the point of the podcast that all our, our listeners are familiar with where I come in and, and uh, control Rob because in the background he's like, I have 40 more questions and, and I say, no, we'll have to we'll have to do that another time. But Ian, I appreciate you joining us. I think uh, great, great conversation. Um, the concept for you know, operations is so important. It keeps, keeps getting clearer and clearer as we keep doing these podcasts. If anyone uh, was interested in following you, learning about your company, where should they go? Good question. We are on, you know, CloudOps, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, etc. We have, uh, but really, our our website. We have a blog post and we have a newsletter, and so really, blogs and newsletters, I think, is is probably probably the best way to get acquainted with what CloudOps is uh, is thinking about and working on with our customers. Well, great. So well, CloudOps.com. Yeah. Great. Everyone go to cloudhouse.com. I know I was out there looking at their blogs before as we were talking. So Ian, thanks for joining us, Rob. Uh, another great podcast and perfect timing to get someone at the Google event to get some, some uh, feedback from it basically as it's happening. So we intentionally did that, correct, Rob? <laughs> Not an accident. All a part of the plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again to both of you and uh, to our listeners. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and uh, stay tuned to next week. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Great talking with you, Rob. Thanks. Bye. It's always a pleasure.